thank you very much for inviting me to speak today um, as part of the Public Office Holders Lecture Series. So the theme of my talk today is how the NZSIS contributes towards protecting New Zealand as a free, open and democratic society. I've been in my role as Director of Security for just over two years, and I think this is a good point to stop and reflect on the organisation that I lead. In particular, I want to answer three main questions over the course of this lecture. Firstly, what are the national security challenges that we face as a country, and how are these changing? Secondly, how well equipped is the NZSIS to meet these challenges? And thirdly, how do we achieve the right balance between the need to maintain the secrecy necessary for us to undertake our work, while also ensuring as much transparency and openness as we are able? Fundamentally, this is an issue of public confidence and trust. Before I seek to answer these questions, I'd like to spend a bit of time going back to the founding legislation of the NZSIS, the New Zealand Security Intelligence Service Act 1969. Contained within the 1969 Act, under the somewhat obscurely numbered section 4AAA1, are the principles that underpin the functions of the NZSIS, and I'd like to read these principles out to you. In performing its functions under this Act, the Security Intelligence Service, A, contributes to keeping New Zealand society secure, independent, and free, and democratic. Now this is perhaps the most important section in the whole Act, it sets out in black and white that the NZSIS is here to keep New Zealand secure, independent, free, and democratic. Everything we do and the reason we exist comes back to this primary purpose. It's why I was so motivated to become the Director of Security and why I'm just as passionate about the role two years on. This mission, underpinned and legitimised by an Act of Parliament almost 50 years ago, is why my staff and I come to work each day. It's why some NZSIS officers are willing to undertake roles that put them in harm's way. They are here to keep New Zealand secure and to preserve our society as free, independent and democratic. The second principle states that the NZSIS contributes to the participation of New Zealand in the maintenance of international security. This clause is fairly self-explanatory, but it is worth noting that it provides for the NZSIS to contribute to international security and not just domestic security. The third principle states that the NZSIS acts in accordance with New Zealand law and all human rights standards recognised by New Zealand law, except to the extent that they are in relation to national security modified by enactment. In the discharge of its operational functions, independently and impartially, with integrity and professionalism, in a manner that facilitates effective democratic oversight. And this provision confirms for the avoidance of doubt that the NZSIS must always operate within the law, recognising that we have special but lawful powers to take such actions that would otherwise not be legal, such as intercepting communications to find out information from individuals or groups that may want to do harm to New Zealand. We are also legislatively required to be impartial, independent and to act with integrity and professionalism. And this requirement is embedded into the DNA of our staff. As you know, the government is currently considering its response to Sir Michael Cullen and Dame Patsy Reddy's independent review of security and intelligence. And as you will appreciate, I can't comment publicly on the proposed changes arising from this review. Public policy, as it affects the NZSIS, is a matter for democratically elected members of parliament and the wider public to consider. But I would like to note the reviewer's penultimate paragraph in the foreword to their report. They say, the Act, which is the new Single Intelligence and Security Act which is proposed, should state clearly that its fundamental purpose is the protection of New Zealand as a free, open and democratic society. That then becomes the guiding principle by which the activities of the agencies must be undertaken and judged. So given this principle underpinning the NZSAS, the first question that I want to address is, what are the threats that New Zealand faces, and by implication, to what extent should New Zealand be worried by these threats? Looking globally, it is clear that the geopolitical tectonic plates are shifting. Just like tectonic plates, when the geopolitical plates shift, the world experiences tremors and eruptions at the fault lines. We see this in the Middle East, with the breakdown of states following the short-lived optimism of the Arab Spring. And most obviously, we have seen a geopolitical eruption with the rise of the Islamic State. 
so-called. But it is not only in the Middle East. We're also seeing the resurgence of a more aggressive Russia, as seen in Crimea, Ukraine, Syria, and elsewhere. The repositioning of the major powers is also playing out in areas like the South China Sea. Of course, countries outside of these immediate hotspots are not immune. The struggle for geopolitical influence extends around the globe, including regions close to us like Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Additionally, the internet and social media have broken down geographic boundaries like never before, meaning that cyber attacks, cyber espionage, and radicalization can happen anywhere in the world with the click of a button. And that's true for New Zealand, and it means that we face security threats like any other country. In some areas, such as counter-terrorism, we are still comparatively fortunate. New Zealand has not suffered an attack at the hands of the so-called Islamic State, unlike similar countries, such as Australia and Canada. The New Zealand national threat level is low, meaning a terrorist attack is assessed as possible, but it's not expected. I'm confident that the low threat level remains appropriate, although I think it is fair to say that while the overall number of individuals of concern remains small, there is a higher proportion of more concerning individuals than there were 18 months ago. I've sometimes been asked why we treat terrorist threats differently from other violent or criminal matters. After all, many people die each year from violent assaults. My answer is that the purpose of a terrorist attack, as its name suggests, is to cause terror among the populace. So not only is terrorism a calculated and targeted act of violence against civilians, but it is also a symbolic act against the value system of the nation, and that is why it is a concern to a security intelligence organisation. For me, one of the things that I love about living in New Zealand is that we can walk the streets free from the fear of the type of events that have happened in Paris, Brussels, Ottawa, London and Sydney. Mostly, people go about their lives without worrying that such events could happen here. As I've said, the chances are indeed low, and that is wonderful. But ultimately, it is my job, and the job of my organisation, to do everything we can to keep it that way. As I've said before, it's our job to worry so you don't have to. And of course there can be no guarantees, but a professional, competent security agency is a vital part in the government's armour in keeping New Zealand secure. In talking about terrorism, I would like to make the point, which I have regularly made, although it is never reported, that terrorism is not a Muslim issue. In a recent North and South issue focused on radical Islam, a member of the Muslim community was reported as saying that within any religion there are fanatics who steal the faith or exploit it for political gain. She said, people say that they're afraid of Muslims because they think ISIS represents Muslims. That's what they think. But that's only valid if you say that the KKK represents Christianity. If only they could see what ISIS is doing to the Muslim world and what they're doing to my home country, Iraq. The Muslim community leaders that I've spoken with have stressed that the sort of individuals who are of interest to the NZSIS do not adhere to the interpretation of Islam that represents the vast majority of New Zealand's Muslim population. Using Islam for a justification of violent acts is abhorrent to the vast majority of New Zealand Muslims who contribute so much to this country. Identifying the underlying causes of radicalization is the subject of a lot of research internationally, but at least some radicalized individuals are youths who are misguidedly searching for a meaningful cause and who are susceptible to very calculated extremist grooming. The unfortunate reality is that a terrorist event in New Zealand would probably have a very negative impact on the New Zealand Muslim population because of the likely public backlash. The experience of other countries is that this backlash in turn can create a negative spiral of distrust and alienation, which creates a fertile ground for further radicalization. Avoiding such a situation is strongly in the interests of both the NZSIS and the Muslim community. That community is an important part of the New Zealand population that my agency serves. <coughs> I believe that we should collectively do all we can to keep a small number of people from threatening our way of life, our diverse communities, and the values such as inclusiveness and trust that we cherish so much. Unsurprisingly, given overseas experience, the NZSIS puts a lot of effort into counter-terrorism, but we're also focused on other significant threats. New Zealand's key institutions, government departments and major businesses are far more likely to be threatened by those seeking to steal their information and data than they are from a terrorist attack. 
Countering espionage and helping institutions protect their people, information and assets are also significant if underreported parts of our work. The NZSIS plays a key role in vetting people whose work requires them to access the most sensitive government information. We also run the whole of government protective security requirements, which we call PSR. The PSR includes mandatory security requirements for 36 government agencies. It's designed to help agencies work out what security threats face their people and the people who interact with them, their assets and their information. We then help agencies figure out what they can do to keep themselves more secure. The PSR is available online and it is also being used by non-government organisations and companies in the private sector as an accessible and practical framework to assess and improve security. Considering the nature of current and likely future threats, the next obvious question is, how well placed is the NZSIS to help keep New Zealand society secure? When I started as Director of Security two years ago, it was on the back of a State Services Commission sponsored performance improvement framework report. And I think a polite summary of the report was that the NZSIS, along with the wider New Zealand intelligence community, had many challenges. In reality, the performance improvement framework showed that this was an organization that had major shortcomings. With the benefit of hindsight, the secrecy that the NZSIS had operated under since its inception had, in some respects, done a considerable damage. Because of its impenetrable exterior and isolation, I don't think anybody was aware how far it had fallen behind over a period of decades in terms of the systems, policies and procedures that one would expect to find in any modern organisation. So the last two years have involved a significant series of internal improvements within the NZSIS in almost every aspect from strategy and planning to HR and financial systems to introducing a proper compliance framework, we are building or rebuilding core systems. Moreover, we've had to do this while the operational tempo has never been greater. To give you a sense of this, when I first applied for the job, no one had heard of ISIL. Terrorism hardly featured in my job interview, and even the performance improvement framework report devoted only a handful of words to the issue. And since then, the NZSIS has been transformed from having a five day a week, nine to five operation to having an organization that regularly operates 24 seven. You will all have heard, no doubt, about the additional investment that the NZSIS received in budget 2016. This investment was made following a rigorous process because the Minister of Finance sets a very high bar for budget bids. The New Zealand intelligence community developed its capability bid collectively over two years, involving more than 20,000 hours of work. One of the benefits of this process is that I suspect that the NZSIS and the intelligence community knows its business better than just about any other government department. The money represents, I think, an endorsement from ministers in the direction that the NZSIS is heading, a confidence that we can deliver, and a clear expectation that we will need to continue to lift our ability to keep New Zealanders secure. The additional investment will enable us, firstly, to continue our program of ensuring that our core systems are fit for purpose and able to support the demands of a modern business, and secondly, to grow our capability to respond to the threats that we're facing. For obvious reasons, I can't specify in detail where the investment will be targeted, but some of the operational areas in which we will invest include additional investigators and collection staff to increase coverage of domestic and international security threats, including counter-terrorism, counter-espionage, and counter-intelligence, and ensuring that government departments, systems, people, and communications are protected, including making the vetting process more effective, efficient, and customer-focused. It will take us the full four years of the investment pathway to safely and successfully grow our capabilities. But at the end of that time, we will be in a significantly better position to meet the demands we face and the technological support we need to do our work. The final question that I wish to answer is, how do we ensure public confidence and trust when much of our work necessarily has to be carried out away from the public spotlight? The reality is that the NZSIS cannot disclose a lot of what it does publicly, and there are several reasons for this. The first is security. The NZSIS has lawful, covert capabilities to find out information that individuals or groups do not want us to know, such as their intention to carry out acts of terror or to steal information. The more we say about the people we're investigating and the particular approaches we use to find out information, the more our adversaries will learn and adapt. 
One of the consequences of the Snowden leaks is that now it is standard for our targets to use encrypted communications, making it harder for us to understand their intentions and motivations. So security is a big reason for not providing detailed information about our work. Another reason is privacy. We're often dealing with incomplete information about individuals. In many cases, we are combining snippets of information and strands of intelligence to build up a coherent intelligence picture, which can be especially challenging when these individuals are often actively trying to conceal their activities. A picture may emerge that a person is definitely of security concern, but in other cases, the investigation ends when we rule an individual out in terms of being of security interest, much in the same way that a criminal investigation by police seeks to rule out suspects. Keeping secret means that we can determine that individuals are not of concern without the loss of privacy that would occur if we had publicly identified them or provided enough information that they were able to be publicly identified. So if secrecy will continue to play a significant part in what we do, how do we ensure the appropriate level of transparency and openness, and how do we create public trust? I'd like to propose five ways. Firstly, I think that as Director of Security, I have a responsibility to communicate in fora such as this about the work that we do and why it matters. It is about openly and honestly explaining what we do and the checks and balances that we operate under. It's about explaining that while the work we do is undoubtedly beyond ordinary, and it is cool working on the kinds of things we are asked to do, our work is underpinned by agency systems and processes that are, in most ways, as normal as any other government department. Although I don't think I'll ever quite get used to having the blinds down on all the windows and not being able to have my mobile phone with me at work. The fact is that the NZSIS is a normal part of the state, which is why our legislation dates back almost 50 years and the NZSIS itself is coming up for its 60th birthday. It's also about ensuring that we openly and transparently respond to Privacy Act and Official Information Act requests and proactively put as much information into the public domain as possible. And so, for example, we will be releasing publicly a summary of the New Zealand Intelligence Community's four-year plan and redacted versions of the 2016 Budget Bid Cabinet Papers as part of Treasury's proactive OIA release. And this will be a first for the intelligence community and a further step towards us being as open and transparent as we can be. Secondly, while the public cannot see everything we do, we have independent overseers who can. The Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, or the IGIS, as she's commonly known in the intelligence community, has the primary role as the watcher of the watchers. She can, and does, investigate what we do and makes her findings and recommendations public. The publication of those reports can be painful for us, especially while we're in the process of addressing the underlying problems but I have no doubt that the Inspector General's <coughs> constant gaze keeps us focused and motivated to improve. On behalf of the public, the Inspector General beams the sunshine into the intelligence agencies that is the best disinfectant. But it would be both simplistic and unsatisfactory <coughs> to characterise the situation as one where public trust rests upon the Inspector General's ability to investigate an untrustworthy NZSIS. Such a characterisation would be inaccurate for several reasons. For a start, it puts unrealistic expectations and responsibilities on the Inspector General. It's not physically possible for her and her staff to review every single thing that we do. The Inspector General does undertake detailed investigations, and they are very important, but her influence is more profound and widespread than that. She's interested in more than specific operations and warrants. Her focus is also on our work at a system level. She wants to know that our underlying policies and processes are robust enough to ensure that we are effective and compliant. She also has a very significant influence at a cultural level. Within the NZSIS, we all know that she may choose to review or investigate anything that we're working on. Her ability to investigate anything means that we are always asking the IGES question. It's the equivalent of the Public Service <laughs> Dominion Post Test. What would the IGES think of this? I regularly hear my staff ask this question in the context of decisions they're taking, and I regularly ask myself the same question. I sometimes think of it, and I've borrowed this from judicial review, as the IGES on my shoulder. This means that the Inspector General's influence is culturally profound and, far more far, and, and more far reaching than the specific investigations that she and her staff undertake. My third point about how we create public trust and confidence is connected to this. Our great systems, processes and people need to be evident to everybody who comes across us, 
whether it's independent reviewers like the performance improvement framework teams, the Auditor General, independent reviewers, ministers, the leader of the opposition, journalists, members of the public with whom we interact, or those reading our annual report. Our story should be consistent and based on facts that we're proud of and for which we have evidence. And as we strengthen our foundations, I feel increasingly confident about that narrative. In many areas, and particularly those involving intrusive capabilities and formal legal authorization, our processes are already strong. For example, except in certain cases of particular urgency, which I won't go into in detail here, the process to obtain an intelligence warrant involves putting together a meticulously crafted application where each statement is supported by carefully documented and assessed intelligence, reviewed by our in-house lawyers, sign off at the deputy director level, a full review by me as director, followed by my affirmation before an external lawyer that the content of the application is true to the best of my knowledge, a further review in the case of a domestic interception warrant by the Commissioner of Security Warrants, and then joint approval by the Commissioner and the Minister in charge of the NZSIS. Every warrant is inspected after the fact by the Office of the Inspector General. So this is one example of careful process. But systems and procedures are only as good as the staff who follow them. And that's why trust and integrity are baked into our recruitment processes. When NZSIS recruits, we require candidates to go through a highly intrusive vetting process. We ask about everything from their most detailed financial information to their personal relationships. The purpose of the vetting process, as outlined in the protective security requirements, is to ensure that the people who have access to the most sensitive classified information are not open to coercion or blackmail and are trustworthy. We also need to model integrity at every level of the organisation. From the day I started, I've always been impressed by the level of care shown by my staff, but it is not just attention to detail or to the letter of the law. It's also hardwired into the culture of the organisation to ask always whether an investigation or a form of collection is necessary and proportionate. I can think of an example that happened within the last year where the deputy director responsible for the intelligence directorate approached me with a warrant involving a particularly intrusive form of surveillance. The deputy director said that he supported the use of this form of intelligence collection and considered that it was both legal and proportionate. He wanted me to know, however, that there had been a lot of internal debate in his team. He suggested that I speak with one of the managers who had a different perspective, not about legality, but about proportionality as to whether the proposed way forward was justified in all the circumstances. I then had a separate one-on-one -on -one conversation with that manager, and she had a very thoughtful and valid perspective. And then I slept on it. The result of hearing both sides of the issue was that we did undertake the surveillance operation, but we made a number of modifications to our approach. We reduced the length of time for which the warrant was sought, and introduced a mandatory weekly review to determine whether the warrant should be continued or cancelled, depending on the value of the intelligence being collected and any other relevant factors. In the end, the form of collection did prove its worth, and the surveillance was only required for a matter of weeks. After that, the warrant was cancelled. I thought that this was a sign of a healthy organisational culture in which we encourage every person to ask the hard questions and we actively seek different perspectives. The fourth way in which we build public trust and confidence is by owning our mistakes. No organisation is perfect, and ours isn't either. Especially while we are still in the process of improving our systems and growing at the same time, we have, and will always, make mistakes. Something I learned from Sujeri Mataparai is the phrase, own it, fix it, learn from it, and move on. I think that applies as much at the organisational level as it does at the individual level. Acknowledging our mistakes honestly and learning from them is essential. I've traversed a lot of ground during this talk, including the legislative basis that defines our work, the threats facing our country, the capability requirements of the NZSIS, and fundamental questions about the balance between secrecy and transparency. As I've said, one of the difficulties of my role is working out how much information I can publicly reveal. Every time I deny something, I implicitly confirm something else later on if I don't deny that as well. A lack of denial is automatically taken as confirmation, but sometimes I'm not in a position to explain the actual situation because it involves delicate sources or classified information. So how to correct inaccuracies can be a real challenge. Most recently, this problem played out in the case of the jihadi brides, as they are colloquially known around the world. 
There were limits on what I could say publicly, in particular in this case because some relevant information had come from partner agencies and it took some time to get their permission to release it. The result was that some people questioned my integrity, which goes to who I am and the values to which I adhere as a public servant. It doesn't mean that I will never make mistakes or make the wrong judgment calls, but I believe absolutely in the impartiality and independence of my role. Moreover, as I explained at the start of this talk, that impartiality is more than a moral or ethical imperative, it is a legal one too. When the Jahani Bride media storm was at its height, a long-serving staff member who has been in the service for 32 years and worked for five directors during her time, said to me, well, you're experiencing what all of your predecessors had experienced. They all arrived with the intention of increasing transparency and all of them threw their hands up and said, it's just too hard. I got a lot of sympathy for my predecessors, believe me, but times have changed and I understand clearly that public support and our authorising environment depend very much on our providing greater openness and transparency. I hope that the greater public engagement that the Director of the GCSB and I have been undertaking will help us as a country to have a more measured, better informed public debate and discussion about the issues involving security and intelligence. As part of that increasing maturity, I want to get beyond being caricatured as either the hero or the zero. I'm neither. I'm a public servant doing the best job I can to lead an organisation <coughs> mandated by Parliament to do its work. And my staff are neither Inspector Clouseau nor James Bond. They're dedicated, hard-working New Zealanders that go the extra mile to keep New Zealand and New Zealanders safe and secure. They do work in an environment that is beyond ordinary, and many of them have skills and attributes that are also beyond ordinary. Because they operate in a complex operational environment, they will sometimes make mistakes, but overwhelmingly the work they do is valuable and useful. And that's why giving lectures such as this one is important. Not everyone will always get what we do, understand why it matters, or really appreciate the difficulties of working in a covert environment. Some people will always misrepresent what we do or be opposed to our existence. But I'm confident that most of the public understands our value and, and why we are needed. We see this every day when we ask members of the public to help us, and they're happy to do so. That public support was confirmed a couple of years ago in some polling undertaken by the New Zealand intelligence community, which showed that over 76% of New Zealanders believe that the NZSIS is good, or very good for New Zealand. So today is another step in explaining what we do and why it matters. Now hopefully you have a better sense of the NZSIS and the role we play in keeping New Zealand society secure, free, open and democratic. Thank you very much.